The Resident Evil series is one that seems to be divided into two. On one hand, we have the classic horror games, and on the other, we have the newer, more action-oriented games. Many fans of the series resent the newer games, and beg for a return to the old style of play. It's this attitude that has drawn me to play many of the classic games, which I wasn't old enough to play the first time around. Recently, I went back and played Resident Evil 3 Nemesis for the GameCube. It's a game that I'd owned for a long time, but have never beaten, and this was only the latest of my many attempts to engage the old Resident Evil. Most reviews on the Resident Evil series claim the classic Resident Evil games, which include 0, 1, 2, 3, and sometimes Code Veronica, to be the best in the series, and I'd like to explore why that might be. In this video, I'll be analyzing what makes the classic games unique, what makes them work, and comparing them to some of the newer games. When mentioning the old Resident Evil, one of the first things that comes to mind is unique camera angles. The older games, besides Code Veronica, used pre-rendered backgrounds which gave better visual results and took up less disk space, at the cost of having a fixed camera. However, in order to maintain continuity as the player moves from one fixed angle to the next, the old Resident Evils had to use what many have dubbed tank controls. Conceptually, it's pretty simple. The direction your character moves in is not relative to the camera, but to their own orientation. This means pressing up will move the character in the direction they're facing, and right will turn the character clockwise, etc., regardless of where the camera is. Tank controls and fixed camera angles are the two most heavily criticized aspects of the old Resident Evils, with the most common buzzword being clunky. I disagree, and I have a few reasons as to why. Mainly, the controls are solid. A big problem with 3D games from the 90s, and many modern games, is that the controls just don't feel precise. However, in the old Resident Evils, I never felt like the character I was controlling did something wrong that wasn't my fault. When tilting the analog stick, the character on the screen always moved and controlled as expected, except for parts of the original PlayStation game, but this was fixed with the GameCube remake. A plus side of the fixed camera is that since the player can't control the camera, there's no way it can get clipped into a wall or get stuck. In this aspect, I feel that the fixed camera and tank movement work in favor of the controls rather than to their detriment. Many complain that the camera provides a bad point of view, and that in some locations you can't see what monster you're shooting at that's coming to kill you. This is definitely a problem, but I feel it's a minor issue that couldn't be fixed without severely changing the game. To circumvent this, either the camera could be placed at a bird's eye view, or an over the shoulder view like in Resident Evil 4. All perspectives would control exactly the same, but the bird's eye view would have a huge detriment to the game's atmosphere, and I don't think the over-the-shoulder perspective would have been technically possible back when the first Resident Evils were made. A first-person view also could have been used, but it would have been extremely difficult to pull off. It's worth noting that in its early stages of development, the original Resident Evil was conceived as a first-person game, but the idea was scrapped. So, for the most part, I don't see the fixed camera as a badly executed mechanic. It just has its inherent flaws. Now, there's a reason that third-person shooters today don't control anything like Resident Evil, and it's technology. As technology has progressed, games have obviously become more and more complex, and tank controls have become a thing of the past. The tank control scheme was first utilized in a 3D environment in the 1992 PC game Alone in the Dark. This game also used fixed camera angles, and the core mechanics of the original Resident Evil were heavily inspired by this game. In both games, you explore a spooky mansion, fend off monsters, and solve item-based puzzles. Alone in the Dark was created at a time in which developers were still trying to come to grips with how to make a game work in 3D, at a time before Super Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time, and so while it's a bit dated, it's respectable how well it works considering the time frame. I can imagine that back then it would have been incredibly difficult to create a freely moving camera centered around a character in the cramped rooms of Alone in the Dark, so it's easy to see why the developers went with fixed angles instead. The reason I brought this up was to show that the core mechanics of Alone in the Dark, and thus Resident Evil, were born from technological limits. <laughs> 
When I say technological limits, I mean that the developers' resources prevented them from making an absolutely ideal game. Personally, I think that if the developers of the original Resident Evil had the resources to make the same game, but with a fully controlled 3D camera, they would've. But due to technical limitations, they went with fixed angles instead. Obviously, this is only my speculation and should be taken with a grain of salt. This isn't the only thing to consider, though. Perhaps the developers of Resident Evil chose tank controls and a fixed camera on purpose, as a stylistic choice rather than a limitation. Barry, thanks for saving my life. To understand why they might have done this, we'd have to go back even further than Alone in the Dark. Before adventure games looked like this, they looked like this. Or this. Alone in the Dark was innovative, but it still had its influences, the main one being the point-and-click adventure style of gameplay. Both Alone in the Dark and point-and-click games consisted of moving from one static screen to the next, exploring an area for clues, a decent amount of reading, puzzle solving, and occasional combat. The main difference between the two is the unique camera angles and 3D style of gameplay in Alone in the Dark. Now, what does this have to do with Resident Evil? Essentially, what I want to communicate is this. Fixed camera angles were an integral part of point-and-click games, which heavily influenced Alone in the Dark, which in turn heavily influenced Resident Evil. I want to point out that Resident Evil's core mechanics are partly due to this lineage, and that Resident Evil, in some ways, has the genes of a point-and-click adventure game. But when we discuss Resident Evil, we never say it's like a point-and-click, or it's like an old adventure game. And that's because there's another major genre at work here. Action games. Now, this term is a pretty wide umbrella, and it can include anything from Galaga to Final Fight to Duke Nukem. But for this video, I'll be using this very loose definition. The goal of the game is to destroy enemies using real-time combat. And for portions of Resident Evil when it's not a point-and-click adventure, you do spend a fair amount of time shooting and exploding and burning your enemies. However, we don't usually say that Resident Evil is an action game, either. In fact, action is a bit of a dirty word in the Resident Evil community. The main word used to insult the new games is action. In my opinion, Resident Evil does have action gameplay, but it's not entirely an action game. This is because the action in Resident Evil works in tandem with its adventure game elements. The game isn't about blowing up zombies. It's about surviving the onslaught as you try to solve puzzles, find items, and progress the story. What Resident Evil takes from action games is not the goal of destroying the enemy, but the tight combat gameplay that is integral to the genre. Now let's recap. Resident Evil, a game released in 1996, was critically acclaimed as a new and unique experience with gameplay somewhere in between old-school adventure and action. It was heavily influenced by Alone in the Dark, a horror game that shared elements with point-and-click adventure games. Resident Evil also took ideas from action games, but with a different goal in mind. Scaring the player. Now, I'm going to begin discussing the horror in Resident Evil, but what I won't be discussing is its aesthetics. This means anything to do with the graphics, the looks of the game's monsters, environments, or music. They're all fine aspects of the games, but what I feel is more important is the way in which Resident Evil's gameplay alone puts the player in a position of fear. In an interview for Resident Evil's 1998 comic book, director Shinji Mikami had this to say about the original Resident Evil. I really wanted to make the game as scary as possible. I believe the player could simultaneously feel fear and enjoy playing the game. I also wanted to let the player fight fear in its own way, and when a critical, desperate situation arose, I wanted the player to be able to blow the enemy to pieces. Good old Shinji. We miss ya. What I really like about Mikami's quote is that he speaks specifically about letting the players themselves fight fear. A common trend in recent horror games is to rely on the game's aesthetics to scare the player and giving gameplay the backseat. In these games, the player is often stripped of any useful combat abilities and is forced to run. I detest this kind of game, and I'm disappointed in how popular they become. 
Don't get me wrong, I don't think they're not scary. Aesthetics are a very effective way of creating a scary experience. It's the fact that the gameplay itself is so underutilized in terms of scaring the player. In classic Resident Evil, the player is given a limited supply of... everything. Limited ammo forces the player to think about each shot, and there's always the problem of whether or not they should save ammo and try to dodge zombies or take them out to make the area safer. Having limited health items allows each enemy encounter to have a great amount of risk. The health that you lose from a zombie is gone forever, and while you can heal, you'll run out of health items eventually, meaning the player has to think critically about how they want to explore an area. Limited saves, in the form of ink ribbons, ensures that the player will be fearful of even saving the game, for fear that if they play it safe and save too often, they'll hit a roadblock and run out of ink ribbons. These elements, combined with the fact that the player never knows when and where enemies may be, create a very tense experience. See what I'm getting at here? The things in Resident Evil that make it truly engaging, and thus scary, are not aesthetic qualities or plot. It's about the things that happen directly to the player and how they react, not what happens to the character on the screen. So, yes, the old games were good. They brought something new and innovative to the table by mixing two distinct but popular genres. They single-handedly created the survival horror genre, and for the most part, stood the test of time. But if that's the case, then why did we end up with... Well, let's take a step back. In a recent interview with IGN, Shinji Mikami said this, with Resident Evil 1, 2, 3, and all the rest of the series before Resident Evil 4, I was always saying to the staff, scaring the player is the number one thing. But for the first time in Resident Evil 4, I told the team that fun gameplay is the most important thing. That's what I said. Then the second thing would be nothing, and the third thing is to be scary. That all came out of the commercial failure of the Resident Evil remake, and then, of course, Resident Evil 4 sold really well. I'll be honest. Resident Evil 4 was my first Resident Evil, and it's probably one of my most favorite games of all time. It's an excellent action game, and it's the first in the series to ditch the fixed cameras for a dynamic over-the-shoulder view. It retains the same tank controls with more precise aiming, and a little bit more freedom of movement. I've put more hours into it than I have any other Resident Evil, and I would still have fun picking it up today. However, I don't see it as any more than an action game. It doesn't scare me, and I don't get as much of a sense of dread from playing it as I do from the old Resident Evils. I simply like it for different reasons. Mikami clearly stated that 4 was made with different goals in mind. Before, it was about simultaneous fun and fear, and after, it was just about fun. The old and new styles of Resident Evil are so polarizingly different that it's hard to compare them. The best I can do is try to provide a common thread that links the series together. I see the Resident Evil games as a combination between point-and-click adventure and action games. If I had to give a pointless quantifiable value to it, I'd say the original Resident Evil was about 50% point-and-click adventure and 50% action game. I'd say Resident Evil 4 is about 75% action with 25% adventure, and every game thereafter being 100% action. I don't see this pattern being reversed anytime soon. Resident Evil was born of a technologically limited era, in which a slow-paced game could break sales records. Today, action and spectacle seem to be what sell games. Some other horror games that I greatly enjoyed were the original Dead Space and the first four Silent Hill games, but both of those series evolved into being more action-oriented. While I do hope that someday a horror game will come along that immerses me in fear, the way that the original Resident Evils did, and I'm looking forward to seeing how Mikami's The Evil Within turns out, the mainstream video game market just doesn't seem like the place for it. So, here's to hoping that true survival horror will manage to survive the action-packed video game market. <laughs>